Hey, everybody. My name is Ari, and I am founder of BioCurious. It's the world's first hacker space for biology. And I'm here to talk to you about, let's see, there we go. Here to talk to you about science. So the typical response I get when I say science is very visceral. Oh, no, <laughs> I'm not a scientist, so please don't get technical on me. Um, but what makes it easy for me to talk about science to non-scientists is I'm not a scientist either. And my journey to where I am today is pretty unusual and perhaps a little interesting. So I'll spend a few minutes to talk about that to show you how anybody, really anybody, if I can do it, can be a part of science and show you some great examples of DIY bio and garage bio that will hopefully inspire you to apply your geek power to science. So let's take a journey back in time to grade school days. What did you think a scientist was? You know, did you think it was quiet geek with glasses and a lab coat? I remember I did. I had to draw the same picture. When I was seven, year old, seven years old, I drew a picture of myself with long hair, just how I looked then, with glasses, lab coat, and I thought it was great, because I love science. But I still had the idea that a scientist was somebody who was quiet, was geeky, was always in the lab, and didn't have a life. I don't really know where I got that, but I believed it. And I've come to realize it's a very commonly held belief. I unfortunately never had the experience until just a few years ago to realize what James had, a classmate of Ashley's. After visiting Fermilab, he realized that scientists is just like everybody else. They have a lot of fun. So let's take a step forward in time to the college years. I had to decide what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And now I know that that's, that's a silly thing to think when you're less than 20 years old, but I felt so much pressure at the time. And I still thought that a scientist was somebody who didn't have a life. And I'd realized that even though I'm a pretty shy, quiet person, I need to step out of that to really get somewhere. So with that misconception in mind, I decided to pursue economics and finance. I had the dream that any Yale econ major had to be an eye banker, to make a lot of money and then do what you wanted and to work at Goldman Sachs. So I, in fact, owe a debt of gratitude to Goldman Sachs for not hiring me because it changed my life. When that happened, and I didn't care that they didn't hire me, and I was actually happy, that really meant something to me. It meant that, well, I should be doing something different. I shouldn't work at Goldman Sachs. So I turned back to my love for science and this importance of health to me. And in the past few years, well, in the past few years, at that time, I had grown this desire to make a positive difference in the world, and it was certainly in conflict with my desire to be an eye banker. So what I did was I just stopped, and I started volunteering at a science lab where I was around scientists for the first time, and things began to change. Um, the lab I worked in was trying to cure macular degeneration and atherosclerosis. If they were successful, they would not only change, but they would save the lives of countless people. And that was a big difference from banking. Being around the scientists had the biggest effect on me, more so than what they were doing, but how they acted. They certainly weren't the scientists that I had drawn when I was seven years old. My misconceptions began to fall away working with these people who were passionate, who were creative, who wanted to make a difference at any cost. And they were the kinds of people who when they didn't have enough money to buy equipment, which is a pretty frequent occurrence, they would make their own. Like this incubator shaker made out of a styrofoam box and powered by a fan motor. And when it overheated, as it inevitably did, it had another fan nearby to cool it off. Or this homemade clean bench, $12,000 brand new. We made it out of Walmart parts for around $125. My first contribution to science came with this piece where after reading a Sky Mall magazine, I realized that the same UV lights, it was actually a wand that you would wave around your body to get rid of germs, would actually be effective at getting rid of unwanted microbes. So we used a HEPA filter, the UV lights, and my plastic bin, which was my donation to science, previously held my clothes, and we created an effective clean bench, which we quality tested, and it functions exactly the same as the 
more expensive version. And it was just within a few months of being around this kind of intention, this kind of passion, this desire to shape the world in a positive way, that I decided this is a change I wanted to be part of. And I decided to start a company. So my friend John Schloendorn, a uh, molecular biologist student, um, and I started a company called Lively. It's a nonprofit. It was meant to do good, not to make a lot of money. <laughs> And we thought that being a nonprofit, we could get enough donations to survive. Um, that wasn't really the case, but um, our interesting struggle ensues. We had unfortunately had a friend pass away from cancer, unable to receive a therapy um, in the US. So we decided to focus on that therapy to make the strides that would be necessary to potentially bring it to the US. And at the time it came, became necessary to do our work, we looked around the Bay Area for lab space, but that was the problem because to do work in the area, you have to rent an incubator, an incubator that takes your IP, but more importantly, it costs around $1,000 to $6,000 per person to rent the space. And ironically, at the same time the recession was happening and equipment was available left and right for pennies on the dollar prices, so it was actually cheaper to build our own lab than to rent lab space. And in fact, that was all we could afford. So any, any great life change begins with a road trip. Our story was no different. So we flew to LA, and our lab was in Mountain View, by the way. We flew to LA, picked up equipment that was liquidated from biotech companies, and drove a U-Haul back to our garage, which we outfitted as a lab, to do cancer research. So we were actually able to do functional research, and the technology that we built was actually uh, funded and is now a for-profit company in Menlo Park. Unfortunately, it didn't quite function as a nonprofit, but another lesson learned. We also learned a few valuable things in the garage. We didn't do it as a gimmick. We did it because we had to. We were outpriced out of the market. People didn't take us seriously. You want to do good and you don't want to make money? Really? So there was, there was a struggle in the broader market. And at the same time as we were doing the research, uh, my co-founder was involved in a lawsuit over a patent that he had developed while he was at university. And I saw how mentally it took him away from what he was doing at the lab, what was important. And I realized that this certainly is not the way to innovation. Um, and more broadly, we realized that you know, the world is just not ready for people like us. Um, so, enter DIY Bio. You know, thank goodness that this group exists and was growing at the same time that we were struggling in our garage to get started. We were lucky. But DIY Bio is a group full of passionate people comprised of engineers, entrepreneurs, artists, hackers, anybody who is curious about science also, not wanting to make money, they're doing it because it's fun, because they love science. And that's what brought me into science when I was little. It reminded me of what's important in life. And in these people, I saw the same sort of passion and creativity that had drawn me to, to the artists, to the entrepreneurs in the past, because these are the visionaries. These are the people who inspire and who innovate, people who make change in the world. I'm going to run through a few great examples of some DIY bio high tech. So they're dropping the cost of standard equipment, doing this for fun and also out of necessity. So for $10 in Amazon uh, parts and a toilet paper tube to amplify your sample, you can make a webcam microscope. Or this 3D printed attachment for a power tool, a Dremel, that spins at a constant temperature to spin down your cells, called the Dremel Fuge, developed by Cajal Garvey. And the open PCR just became available. And I helped build the first one. <laughs> um, this is a DNA copier that is used as the, at the crux of all DNA research. So DNA is really, really tiny. If you want to do anything with it, you need to copy it billions of times over. Um, design is also available online, or you can buy a kit. Now moving into nanotech, this is an open source electron microscope, and it has a big cost differential, as you can see. 
So the spiker box came out of a very interesting story. You see me there chopping the leg off of a cockroach. We were using it to test for neuronal activity. And we're using the spiker box. So you can buy it for a $50 kit. And otherwise, it's only available in a university. And that's Tim Marzullo, co-founder with Greg Gage of Backyard Brains and the Spiker Box, who, out of frustration being, of having to wait until they got into a PhD program to use tools like this, they decided to build their own and to make it available to everybody. And they go around the country teaching kids how to do neuroscience. Kids as young as four are doing this. And they can do it. So can we. So these people are, are doing things out of necessity. They're doing things out of passion. And they're doing things to share with the world. They're creating a dream of biotech without borders. There are labs in the country that don't have enough money, just like the one that I worked in, to buy equipment that they need to do basic research. More broadly, there are areas in the world that have no labs, that have no ability to do research. People like those I've just shown you are creating tools that are open source, can be built with off-the-shelf parts. Designs can be downloaded anywhere in the world, enabling research in areas that have never done scientific work there before. And it is with this dream in mind and the desire to enable people who have potential passion, but maybe not a lot of money, to do great research that I, with a few friends, started BioCurious. It's a community for science lovers, again, just like with DIY Bio, it's for anybody. We speak a common language, and we gather around this shared love for innovation in bio. I started meeting in my garage, and soon enough, demand grew. Kind of surprised us, actually. Um, before long, we were the largest DIY bio regional group, standing now at over 500 members in Silicon Valley. And before we knew it, we needed a bigger space. To put it simply, we needed a bigger garage. So always inspired by our community, we decided to crowdfund money. And we raised just over $35,000 on Kickstarter. It's a new crowdfunding platform. I mention this because, well, it helped us do what we wanted to do to create the world's first hacker space for biotech. But it's an important example of getting started without a VC telling you what to do or being tied to investors that cause you to give them a return on investment. What that would have caused us to do had we gone with investors is translate the cost down to our members, in essence, creating the same sort of incubator that myself and my co-founder were unable to afford. So that's not the way to make change. Um, we did it with the community. And honestly, it was a struggle. So I went into what I did with a certain amount of naivete and just a desire to make change. Um, another lesson I learned is it's very hard to find space with only $35,000 in the bank and no credit history. Um, but after a very long and hard search, the founding team of BioCurious finally found a space, 2,400 square foot facility in Sunnyvale. They're just having our first meeting there. Uh, we entered the space July 1st, and we are toasting BioCurious on tables we built about 15 minutes before that. So in the past month, I've been really busy getting this talk ready and getting the lab ready. And staying up till 1 AM, helping build our own lab benches. They were inspired by Make. So thanks again to O'Reilly. And cost just under, I should say, uh, just under $300 to build, whereas brand new, they can cost thousands. So to further enable biotech work, we use off-the-shelf supplies as well. So you can get a lot of things you need for scientific research from the drugstore, from the grocery store, even see agar for gels from the Asian Mart. And this is a picture I just got yesterday. Uh, as I was flying here, we did our first class with Singularity University, uh, which is um, an un-university held at NASA Ames in Mountain View, where they're learning how to uh, test their genes. They're learning about bioinformatics. And they're making bacteria glow green. Um, they're expressing what's called GFP, green fluorescent protein, in bacteria. Close-up shot. Um, 
Doesn't it look fun? So I'm going to leave you with the mission of BioCurious, which is we believe innovations in biotech should be accessible, available, accessible, affordable, and open to everybody. We're building a community lab for entrepreneurs, amateurs, inventors, and anybody who wants to experiment with friends. You can join us starting August. So our mission, in other words, is to create the pubs and the coffee houses of old where great thinkers of the time would meet together to discuss great ideas and, crucially, what they were going to do about them. These are the thinkers that set the foundation for the worlds that we live in today. Science touches everything that we do, from the food that we eat to the cities we live in. It's amazing what can happen over a few drinks with good friends, a great idea, and the tools to make things happen. Thank you.